So good morning, welcome to class two of Nano 101, Intro to Nano Engineering. I'm going to do something this year that uh, I've never done in a class, and that is to put all the, is to record videos of all the lectures and put them on YouTube. So um, I have put the lecture from Monday on my YouTube channel, which is just Darren Lapomi. It's easy to find. Um, and you can uh, re-watch the lectures there. Now, um, because this is, it's going to be a, a helpful uh, resource, but it's meant to supplement class. So please still come to class. Yeah, right. <laughs> 9 a.m. Still come to class. Please still come to class, and the reason is because I can, uh, you, because you can direct the flow of class if you're here. You can give me uh, quizzical gestures and ask questions and help bring this discussion along so that we all, um, so that we all learn uh, together, and so that it helps me keep the uh, the right pace. So. We started talking. Uh, any questions about about the class uh, so far? Anyone here for the first time and need the syllabus? Also, I should say that I'm not going to guarantee. Can you come down and get it? Yeah. Um, I I can't guarantee that I will uh, always upload the video to YouTube because um, kind of takes a while. To, uh, to do it, um, so it's just going to be a supplement. You still have to come to class, and there may be bonus points involved um, on randomly selected days for people that are actually sitting in class. So um, that I can I can guarantee that there may be bonus points. Okay, last time we started talking about different effects of size confinement, and in particular, we were talking about surface tension as a manifestation of the fact that a molecule would rather be in the bulk of either a solid or a liquid, but there's only a surface tension in a liquid because the interior, because the bulk of a liquid doesn't actually store any mechanical energy, it just sloshes around. Whereas in a, in a liquid, it's only the, it's the surface that, that stores mechanical energy because molecules in the bulk don't want to go to the surface because they lose all of their uh, their <laughs> valency, but they lose uh, several several molecules with which they are bonded by van der Waals force or hydrogen bonding or uh, or ionic bonding or what have you. So it creates some interesting phenomena. We talked about sandcastles. So imagine that this solid solid means sand, and imagine that there's this liquid bridge in between. And you can do this experiment at home just by um, put running your finger under water and then going like this. And you can actually see the meniscus form between your fingers and you can actually feel a little bit of the force, right, as, the, as that meniscus um, gets stretched out and finally, uh, finally snaps. Um, so, uh, so why does the, uh, there was a question a lot that ended class last time, why does this meniscus want to stretch out like this, which has the effect of bringing the solid surfaces together? Well, it only occurs when the solid surfaces have a high enough surface energy. They're high enough, it's high enough in electrostatic potential energy to want to be covered by this liquid, which lowers the electrostatic potential energy of the system. Now, it's a, uh, it's a complex balance between the, the liquid-solid interface, the liquid-gas interface, and the solid-gas interface. But in general, in order to minimize the energy of the system, the, uh, the meniscus wants to spread out in the direction of its, uh, of its concave surface. And that driving force is manifested in something called the Laplace pressure, which is the dip pressure difference between between the, uh, the, the medium, in this case the gas, and the liquid. In the case of a bubble or droplet, the Laplace pressure, and this is all from last time, I just wanted to redraw it before class started. In the case of the bubble or droplet, the Laplace pressure is the pressure difference created by an interfacial tension of the 
Laplace pressure always wanting to squeeze the bubble or droplet in to reduce the amount of interface, because interface is bad in a way. Interface is high in potential energy, so we want to reduce the amount of interface we have, hence why a surface tension always wants to shrink the size of the surface. And the, this relation is, uh, for a case of, of, of a spherical droplet, we have 2 gamma over r, and that gives you the Laplace pressure, which again is the pressure difference. It's not the absolute pressure in here, it's the pressure difference between inside the bubble or droplet and the outside. Yeah? So is the force always going to inward whether it's bubble or droplet, or is it the case of with gas, it's just saying liquid medium? That's a good question. It always points inward whether it's a bubble or a droplet. Um, because in, in, the, in each case, what it's trying to do is minimize the interfacial area. In the case of a meniscus, which is the opposite of a bubble or droplet, it points outward. And the, the way to think about this is you can picture the Laplace pressure as a little bit like a satellite dish. So the Laplace pressure vector always points <laughs> outward from the, uh, from the concave surface, from the concave interface. Now this, the Laplace pressure, okay, how much pressure difference could there actually be? And this is actually quite a profound insight from the effects of size confinement in that if you just plug some, uh, some numbers in here, imagine an air bubble in water. If you have a radius of one millimeter, the Laplace pressure is 145 newtons per square meter. Newton per, what's atmospheric pressure in newtons per square meter? Newton per square meter has, a, uh, has, a, has an SI unit of uh, pascals. So how many newtons per square meter all around us right now? What, are, what is the atmosphere pushing on us now in newtons per square meter, and what are, what are we at equilibrium pushing back on the outside? About 100, about 100,000, so about 10 to the 5. So is this not too much of a pressure difference? Okay, Laplace pressure, who cares, right? Well, if you shrink this, this bubble down by an order of magnitude, by three orders of magnitude, so one micron. So a little bit less than the, so about 10 times less than the thickness of a, of a human hair. What is the Laplace pressure? Now, hundred forty five kilopascals so now you have an atmosphere of extra pressure inside the droplet now what if we have something that's truly nanoscopic so we have R equals 10 nanometers or nanometers if you prefer we have one uh, 145 megapascals or 140 atmospheres. So in fact, some, there's some research being done um, on the use of bubbles and droplets as like bombs, as nanoscopic bombs. You can functionalize the interface and you can target a bubble or droplet to a, say, a cancer cell. And it fuses with the cancer cell, then all that pressure could be released and you could, you could blow up the target because there's all this extra uh, pressure inside, inside the droplet. And this is all an effect of trying to shrink the, uh, the interfacial area uh, itself. Okay, so interestingly, we have, uh, we talked a little, bit, a little bit about Van der Waals forces before, and thinking about, uh, thinking about structures in nature that take advantage of forces over uh, over small distances. Has anybody ever seen a gecko walk around on a wall or a ceiling? So how does it do that? What's the, how does how does the gecko foot stick? 
to something. Yep. Okay, so the, the by the Vanderbilt's force, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Why couldn't it be by a by a capillary force? So suppose you have geckos live in humid environments, in uh, rainforest and and uh, uh, equatorial climates. So it's very humid there. There's a little film of water on pretty much every surface. So why wouldn't the gecko foot stick? And by the way, the gecko foot is like a toothbrush. Or every little uh, um, uh, sete, what is this called? A sete, is subdivided into a lot of little spatula. And each one of these things is made of keratin, which is a, which is a protein found in skin and, and sort of medium soft tissue in biological systems. And it is about what you use to grill flip eggs and stuff. This is about 100 nanometers on a side. So how is it working? How's the gecko foot working? So suppose you come up to a, to a tree or something, and then um, you, form, you can form a capillary bridge with the tree. So, so for a long time, uh, well, actually, originally, it was predicted that a gecko foot just sticks by Vanderbilt's force. Then a, a very famous paper came out, and it said, no, it's by capillary forces, because we have their, uh, as you increase the relative humidity, the adhesion of a gecko foot, the poor gecko, they actually did this in a lab. The adhesion of the, ge of the gecko actually increases. Uh, so they thought, well, throw out Vanderbilt's force, it's all capillary forces. It's all these, these capillary bridges, the same way that, uh, that sand castles are made. But uh, there was another paper a couple of years later, and in fact, this is after 2010. So as much as we're doing in, the, in, in as much sophistication as there is in science and medicine and commercial aviation and consumer electronics, we still just only figured out how geckos stick to walls. <laughs> there is an effect of humidity on the adhesion, but it's because it changes the mechanical properties of the keratin the keratin is able to conform even more nanoscopically to the atomically rough surfaces of trees and walls so that it's harder to pull off. So what it does is it increases the projected, or it increases the, the integrated surface area of contact between the gecko feet and the surface. So there is a, 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 an influence of relative humidity, which points to capillary forces, but it's been shown that you change the mechanical properties, you make the keratin more sticky. Um, same way that glue works, by the way, or adhesive tape works. So you have some scotch tape and it sticks to a wall. Why does it stick to a wall? Is there any chemical bonding to the wall? No, it's purely Van der Waals force. Now, why doesn't the, the back side of tape stick to walls? Why is there, why is the sticky, why does only the sticky side of tape stick to walls? Because it's softer, because it's softer, it's a viscoelastic polymer that can conform to the nanoscopic features and roughness in whatever surface that it's sticking to. And that greatly increases the, uh, the integrated contact area and the absolute value of the Van der Waals force is therefore high enough to keep your posters or whatever sticking to walls. Yep. <laughs> yes. In, but in any, in an atmosphere with any appreciable amount of humidity, you'll always have a capillary bridge between, um, between 
hydrophilic objects, that is, surfaces that, that like water. Yeah? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so nanotechnology, uh, the manifestations of nanoscience exist uh, all around us in the form of gecko feed and capillarity. Interestingly, capillarity is one of the mechanisms by which, by which water traverses the trunks of trees. So you have these this uh, sponge-like structure in the cellulose in a tree, say a redwood tree that could be 200 feet tall, and it is sufficient to uh, the the uh, the smallness of the of the uh, of the uh, apertures or the, of the um, void space in the cellulose is enough to draw water up into the tree by capillary forces. So these are these are really significant uh, effects. But what about engineered uh, structures. So present day nanotechnology. A lot of things that we use every day and have used for a hundred years are actually unintentionally nanostructured solutions, nano-engineered nano solutions. So carbon reinforced rubber. This could be carbon black in the case of tires, or it could be uh, very small silica particles in the case of, say, the, the, the soles of shoes that happen to be white. Um, and what these do is they change the, uh, the thermal properties of the materials and they make them tougher and stiffer. How about sunscreen? So I'll just write the name of the nanoparticle up here. <coughs> silica sunscreen uses titanium dioxide nanoparticles and these are all between about 10 to 100 nanometers roughly we don't think of thin films as being nanoscopic but if you're wearing eyeglasses you have a bunch of nano nanoscopic coatings on them that are nanoscale in one dimension that is the thickness so say optical coatings like uh, scotch guarding. <coughs> Anyone ever bought a, or received an athletic shirt or socks that say, like, I don't know what they say, stink resistant or something, antibacterial? And how does that work? Well, they have silver nanoparticles in them. And the silver nanoparticles are toxic to bacteria. We'll just call them scientifically anti-stink socks. And they have bactericidal um, silver nanoparticles. One of the biggest areas of nano, uh, nano engineered solutions is in drug delivery. And many of you will probably go on to careers um, in this area. And an example, there are many different kinds of drug delivery vehicles in terms of nanoparticles. The, the first one to be, uh, to be explored and actually the first one to be commercialized is something called the liposome. 
So a liposomal nanoparticle drug. So there is an example of a small molecule drug called uh, doxorubicin. is an anti-cancer drug. And the problem with small molecule drugs, and by small molecule drugs I mean like anything that's not a protein, anything that's an organic compound like acetaminophen, ibuprofen, aspirin, which is acetyl salicylic acid, I'll say that five times fast. Any of those small molecule drugs don't have selectivity where they go. They just go all through your body and they, the, the interactions with your physiology are not always good, right? So what we want to be able to do is target those drugs to where we want them to go. The anti-cancer drug, we want it to go to the tumor cell. So a couple decades ago, a nanoparticle formulation, a liposomal formulation of doxorubicin was invented called, uh, called doxel. I'm not going to show you exactly what the structure of doxorubicin and doxel are, but the basic idea of a liposome is that you have the formation of bilayer vesicles where the dots are charged species. This is going to a horrible drawing, but I'll do my best. And the little wavy lines are hydrophobic molecules. So this is the polar a uh, head group, and this is the hydrophobic tail. And the diameters of these nanoparticles could be somewhere between 10 to 100 nanometers. And because you have this type of particle, and it's roughly spherical in shape, it's called a bilayer vesicle. What's a famous example of a bilayer vesicle? There are trillions of them in us, cells. And because these structures form automatically, given the right conditions of putting these, uh, these uh, lipids in a solution, you, you, have some, uh, you have some choices of what you want to do. You can add some, uh, some group on here, we'll call it a star that, uh, that evades immune detection. You might also have some group, we'll call it a um, smiley face that, uh, that might be the, the, the targeting site. So it might be a protein or some, some binding, something that binds to a protein that's specifically expressed in a cancer cell, for example. So this could be like a targeting. site, and in the middle, you would put a water-soluble drug. <laughs> or actually, in the bulk of the bi bilayer vesicle, you could put a hydrophobic drug. Okay, another example of commercial nanotechnology, then we'll be, uh, then we'll be, uh, we'll move on to something else. What about microelectronics?
Why did I put micro in quotes? It's commercial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Anti-cancer therapeutics, uh, liposomal nanoparticle formulate, liposomal formulations are ubiquitous in anti-cancer therapy. So microelectronics. Why was micro in quotes? Yeah. So. We're actually well within the nano structured regime. Actually, we haven't been micro since probably since my first desktop computer. It's 1993, <laughs> ages ago. And it was a 486, it was an Intel 486. And I think it had like, well, this is gonna be on YouTube forever, so someone can just look, look it up if I'm wrong. I dare you, I dare you. Something like a micron, something like a micron half pitch, which is the separation between uh, between structures in a um, uh, in a microprocessor or memory device. It could be a transistor. In either case, it's transistors or groupings of transistors. The smallest pitch uh, producible by these uh, by the processes now that we use are in 2017. <coughs> somewhere around 10 nanometers. Okay, these are interesting examples to, uh, to, to end this section on because biology and vesicles and micelles are examples of nanotechnology where you just kind of dump and chuck all this stuff, right? Well, maybe not with biology, but certainly with vesicles and things. Put all this stuff in a flask and you shake it up and you hope, or maybe, maybe it's a little more sophisticated than that, but eventually you get something that's nanostructured. In this case, microelectronics, you take a, uh, you take a design that you made in CAD and you make a mask by electron beam lithography, which we talked about last time, then you take that that mask and you expose a million wafers uh, with it and then you do that 50 times to build up the complexity. So we call this and so so we call this this bottom up nanotechnology. And we call this as a uh, microelectronics as an archetype of top down nanotechnology. So what, what are some characteristics of bottom up and top down and how might they be combined? So top down versus bottom up. Picture a uh, picture a marble sculpture, top down. Where one takes, say, Michelangelo is carving David, and <laughs> David was actually in that marble block until well, and what Michelangelo did was just release. David from that marble block. Solid block, just chisel away at stuff until the sculpture appears. You can make a sculpture by bottom-up methods too. And that would be like a clay or porcelain structure, uh, sculpture. Words associated with top-down, we usually think about fabrication. Fabrication is a funny word to use in science and engineering because it means to some ears in some fields that you've fabricated your results. In the case of nano engineering, 
we want to fabricate as many results as possible. Oh, I'm sorry, that's also recorded. But I hope it's never taken out of context. Famous last words. <laughs> we want to fabricate structures, make them from, from components by, by etching, by, uh, by, uh, by careful design. And bottom up is usually called synthesis. Sometimes people are parochial about the difference between top down and, and bottom up. They say, well, you know, the only pure form of nanoscience is bottom up. Top down, you're just etching stuff, just destroying things. But that's really a, a kind of a chauvinistic way to, uh, to, to approach um, really what are, are beautiful techniques on both sides. A lot of times top down is associated with hard materials like silicon and metals. Bottom up tends to be with soft materials, biological structures, and so on. Characteristically, top-down is used in electronics. Bottom-up is used in biology and medicine. Top-down is often, this could be controversial, but no problem being controversial here. Product of the human brain. Whereas bottom-up could be a natural consequence of thermodynamics. And then we have the pejorative etched and versus assembled. There's nothing wrong with etching. One of the reasons, by the way, that I'm recording these lectures and putting them on YouTube is so that you can Look at some sections again, watch some sections again in a, in a couple of years after you've seen more uh, of, the, of the, the course material in nanoengineering, maybe done some research or some internships, and you can go back. And I think there's, there's really a lot of, I could talk for an hour each on one of these, one of these topics. And, uh, and, I, and I hope that, uh, that, that maybe some, uh, someday after you have some experience working with these materials, He'll come back and say, oh, that's, that's what he was talking about. OK, that makes a little bit more sense now that I've worked with, with these structures myself. Nanotechnology for a long time has, uh, has had a lot of hype associated with it. Has anybody ever read uh, Prey by Michael Crichton? One, two. People are embarrassed to say they've read it. They should, shouldn't be. OK. Um, I read it. I read it while I was in grad school. I was spin coating a bunch of polymer films. I'd spin coat 100 films in a row, all on the same surface. And I just read my copy of Prey while I was, while I was held the pipette in one hand and the book in the other hand. And by the end, I probably had to throw away the book because it was covered in chemicals and uh, nasty <laughs> stuff. Um, but, uh, but in Prey, the, uh, there are these little nanobots that go around and devour human beings. And, uh, and it was sort of, um, <laughs> it was, it was sort of cool. Uh, and, and it was, and, um, it was kind of a take on a book by, uh, Eric Drexler called Engines of Creation, published in the mid eighties on, um, on molecular, the concept of molecular assemblers, where you have this tree-like structure that has a, a trunk and a bunch of branches that, that assemble materials atom by atom. Uh, and
and eventually you create so many of these little self-replicating bots that, that they swarm around and devour things and take over the earth. And that's called uh, like gray goo. So you might have heard the term gray goo before. That came from uh, engines of, of creation. Um, it's particularly a physicist's description of the future of nanotechnology because what are molecular assemblers in real life but enzymes, things that have literally assembled the most complicated um, physical objects that we know about, namely uh, biological organisms. And they are actually assembled molecularly by things that exist in water and, and use the con concepts of uh, reactions that are sort of known in organic chemistry and biochemistry to assemble, uh, to assemble complexity. So, uh, so there's some some amount of amount of, of hype. It's my my uh, personal opinion that it is probably better to deal with the environmental concerns, with with the societal concerns of nanotechnology, the same way that we deal with chemical hygiene. So you don't want nanoparticles in the ocean, just like the way you don't want, uh, you don't want pesticides uh, everywhere where they're not supposed to be. Um, and in the case of little nanobots that devour everything, we're not there yet. Soon, soon we will be there. We're not there yet. Uh, but once we are, it's probably um, our responsibility as well as the responsibility of the uh, the artificial intelligence community, quite honestly, to make sure that these things are done in, uh, in ethical ways. But again, we're not there yet. But so, so. Um, anyone ever read um, Spiral by Paul McEwen from Cornell? So this is a book. Um, so Paul McEwen is a, is a famous nano scale physicist. He worked a lot in graphene, carbon nanotubes, um, uh, nanoscale electronics and, and mechanics. Um, and he wrote a book that was actually a thriller called Spiral. And it's way better than Prey. <laughs> um, but and it's a, it's a, you know, you can, you can buy it on Amazon. Um, and uh, I think it might be a movie someday. I don't know if the rights have been purchased, but it's very, it's very good. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, and because he's a practicing uh, nano scientist, he's a professor of physics at Cornell, um, it's, it's a little out there, but it's, it's, it's good. All right. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about size confinement. So this is sort of size confinement using physical and thermodynamic processes, manifestations of intramolecular forces. What about optical effects? How, do, how does size confinement produce um, colors in biological materials that are actually nanoscopic? Believe it or not, beta carotene is an organic semiconductor, um, and it's a nanoscale organic semiconductor. Um, how, does, how does size confinement in structures, nanoscale structures like quantum dots, um, organic dye molecules, biological dye molecules, how does size confinement give rise to the colors? So before um, we get into that, I'll, we'll chat briefly about what happens when light interacts with, uh, with matter. Nanophotonics. Light matter interactions. So, what happens when light interacts with a uh, with a molecule or with a with a, with a structure. We have uh, 
uh, why is, um, how is this chalk, the chalk on the board interacting with the light? Why do we, how do we see it? Reflecting the light in the, in the visible spectrum. Is it, um, is it, is it collimated light? That is, do we need to be standing in a particular relationship in order to see it as though it were a laser? So it's scattering, the light is scattered. The light comes down here, sees all of these little micron scale chalk particles in the grooves in the board and it's scattering, it's scattered. So, scattering, what about This room is so gray, it's so hard to find something with some color in it. Why does this uh, box appear yellow? Just in, in one word, there is something going on with the dye molecules. It's taking in the white light and absorption. Something's being absorbed so that the rest of the colors are, uh, are, 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 are scattered or, or re-emitted. Re What else could happen? Is something always, so, so before chemistry happens, scattering or absorption uh, has to happen, but something else can happen too, and this is a trick question, because it's possible that nothing happens. In fact, it's very likely that nothing happens. We have this whole board to explore the concept of nothing. Just kidding, we're not gonna write anything there. Scattering, scattering is what? Scattering, so when a, when a photon comes, and a photon of course looks like this. <laughs> photon comes and strikes some kind of, some kind of uh, um, association of some electron cloud. And what the photon does is it uh, is it is transiently absorbed by this electron cloud and immediately re-emitted in, in any direction. So absor immediate absorption and re-emission. And this absorption and re-emission can happen in, in a couple of different ways. It's called elastic scattering. Raleigh scattering, which is the transient absorption and re-emission of photons. And there's no change in energy of the scattered photon. So a blue photon goes in, a blue photon is scattered. No change in energy versus incident versus the scattered That says, hurry up. That is, it's an alarm I set to me to tell myself to hurry up. Five minutes left. Okay, it can also be scattered inelastically. So what happens is that molecules and nanoparticles have some vibrational modes associated with them. It's primarily a molecular phenomenon. So molecules and parts of molecules, so therefore parts of 
nanoparticles made of molecules are vibrating to some, uh, some frequency. And what happens is that a photon comes in and it scatters off of this vibrating molecule. And as the photon comes in, can I walk and chew gum at the same time? Let's see. The photon comes in and then, then the, uh, okay, you got it by my pantomime, great. Okay, so the, the energy of the vibration changes and therefore it changes the energy of the scattered photon. So this is an inelastic process where the uh, photon changes the vibrational uh, frequency and therefore energy of the molecule and the photon care in the scattered photon carries the difference in energy <laughs> and this is called Raman scattering, named after Professor Scattering. And there is a special kind of Raman scattering called surface enhanced. Raman scattering called SIRS, excuse me, SIRS, called SIRS, which is a very active area of nanoengineering. Now, it's not really surface enhanced Raman scattering. A pure mathematically smooth surface gives you no enhancement of the Raman signal. It's actually nano enhanced Raman scattering but it's called surface enhanced Raman scattering. It's actually nano enhanced Raman scattering. And the reason is because little nano particles, nano structured edges will, uh, will resonate the conduction electrons in the, uh, in the nanostructure will resonate like an antenna with the frequency of an incoming photon. And therefore the electric field in the vicinity of those oscillating conduction electrons in the metallic nanoparticle will be, the, the concentration of the electric field will increase the effective, um, the effective ability of a nearby molecule to undergo Raman scattering. Why do we care about Raman scattering? Because every molecule has its own Raman scattering spectrum. So if you have an, an effective SIRS device, you can put it into the bloodstream, for example, and you can measure the signals produced by proteins or small molecules without having to label them. So each molecule has a fingerprint that is associated with all of its little uh, vibrating dipoles in the molecule. And as it, uh, as it interacts with these nanostructured surfaces, those, um, those vibrational frequencies are detected as a fingerprint of those molecules or proteins. So we can detect uh, toxic things or biological processes uh, using SIRS. That's where I'm going to end for today. Thank you very much for your attention.